What's going on, Wolfpack? My name is Denaric Wolf, and welcome to some more Bosnia Reacts 2 feature history. The Fall of Yugoslavia Part 1 out of 2, and Part 2 out of 2 I'll be doing in a separate video. Now, uh, for those who haven't heard of feature history, he is actually an Australian YouTuber uh, making animations regarding to you guessed it, history. Uh, but an interesting story behind him, if it's true, and he said this in a Q&A once, that uh, when he started making this channel, he was, as a matter of fact, a high school dropout. Because apparently I read in Australia, finishing high school isn't necessarily compulsory. Okay. And you can drop out apparently and he did and he decided to make youtube videos instead uh but judging by the amount of subscribers he has probably it paid off in the end if that story is indeed true so uh i am a bit of an expert on things regarding goose well i wouldn't consider myself an expert really but uh i know a thing or two definitely when when it comes to yugoslavia and why it fell and could it have been prevented or not if you ask me no not really Today we're going to crack open the case on Yugoslavia, uh -oh. or should I say, Yugoslavia. <laughs> I'm going to kill myself. None of his characters have eyes, by the way. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Feature History, featuring the fall of Yugoslavia and most likely a shitstorm in the comments. Now this video, or videos, <laughs> are going to be quite long and complicated, so I'm not going to pad this intro out too long, like I'm doing right now. I should really stop. The series of wars that saw the end of Yugoslavia brought a close on an era and opened a new one alongside the dawn of a new millennia. This new era began in an orgy of violence, war crimes, and geopolitics. Great stuff. But first, I should bring us back to the old era. And the older era. Maybe even the older era. Get someone to eat, this will be a long one. The Balkans, for a measurably long-ass time, has been an ethnically diverse region in Europe. It served as a border of Western, Eastern, and Islamic worlds. Its long history consists of many independent kingdoms as well as even more empires attempting to conquer the region. The Byzantines, Ottomans, and Austrians all took their shot at the region, but as nationalism took hold in the late 19th century, things were to change. Yugoslavia, a unified... So, uh... If you look at the map of Europe, uh, you'll notice a few things. Notice how one, uh, a lot of it is flatland area especially the northern european plain stretching from france to russia if you look at the nation states there you would see france a powerful united uh united enough nation state uh germany as well a large ethnic group uh, even poland ukraine ukrainians uh and especially russians so on flatland areas you, it's a lot more it's a lot easier to unite the ethnicity Due in large to the fact that, well, war is, you know, very easy on a flatland, so there really there's nowhere to run and hide on a flatland. So that's how the French ended up uniting uh, what we now know as France, despite the fact that there were, there were yeah, different people groups, especially if in, on the Brittany Peninsula. There was a Celtic people group there. Uh, you had the Gascons to the south. The Occitans to the south as well, Savoyards, and eventually it all coesced into a Frenchian culture. Uh, basically, the culture was from Paris because Paris found it easy to unite that area. Same goes for Germans, but it same goes for Poles, for Russians. You know, those are wide open flatlands that are easy to unite. Now, the Balkans is uh, one of the most mountainous, hilliest, uh, most rugged areas of all of Europe. And this is why you have so many ethnic groups. In such a small area because it's difficult to unite culturally because there's not much communication going on because of those mountains uh, or lack of any uh, serious navigable waterway networks um with the exception being the danube i guess and the saba rivers but for the most part it doesn't have as many navigable waterways as other parts of europe and of course if you want to go to war it's difficult uh, to defeat all the rest of the ethnic groups because they can always just lick their go, run to the hills, lick their wounds, uh, muster their strength, and counterattack, making it nearly impossible. You take one valley, uh, the other valley is going to fall. You take that valley back, and the valley you just took is going to fall. <laughs> to the it's basically a impossible game to win, uh, which is what why we ended up with 
the Balkans as, as the way that they are. Now, even before uh, the Slavic migration to this area, the Illyrian peoples of this area was were also disunited. They were very fierce, from what I heard, but also very disunited. They fought amongst each other a lot. So, uh, uniting this area, very difficult. Even for empires holding on to this area, very difficult. Ottomans tried it. As powerful as the Ottomans were, couldn't do it. Austria-Hungary, couldn't do it. Uh, heck, even the Italians tried a little bit, couldn't do it. But... It's not that they can just leave this area alone. You think, well, why don't the empires just leave it alone if it's so hard to hold on to it? Well, the Balkans is the bridge between Asia and Europe. Your other option getting to Asia would be going through the steppes of Russia and then into Central Asia and then somehow into uh, Asia. That's probably not an option. It's much easier to just go through the Balkans into Asia Minor or uh, I guess Turkey nowadays and then into wider Asia. So having the Balkans... A very important land route to Asia and to Europe as well. So a lot of people want it. Hard to hold on to it. Hold, hard to unite. It's just the way that it, this is why it's so unstable. The Unified Kingdom of Southern Slavs was a dream of their intellectuals as early as the 17th century. It would be the ticket to their independence, a state united and a state that could resist foreign tyranny. Near the end of World War I, the Southern Slavs under Austro-Hungarian rule broke away as a state of Slovenes, Croats and Serbs. The whole thing was a bit of a mess, and they turned to the only person who had an army in the area, the Kingdom of Serbia. They willingly entered a state of union with Serbia and Montenegro, forming the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes on December 1st, 1918. It was later retitled to the Kingdom of Yugoslavia in 1929, considering the old name was shit. Time passed and the Kingdom was alright. But in the late 1930s, their province of Croatia was pressured by Nazi Germany and fascist Italy and- Okay, he skipped over a lot of things from the looks of it. He didn't even mention Stjepan Radic which was an ethnic Croat uh, that didn't really like the centralized Serb rule from Belgrade. Yeah, it's not that everyone was like hip, you know, cheery and everything was nice. There was Then Stepan Radic was assassinated by Serbs. And, uh, you know, the name has Yugoslavia in it. So people are thinking, wait, what, why isn't Bulgaria in it as well? Well, Bulgaria didn't really have the best relations with Serbia and Yugoslavia at the time. As a matter of fact, one... A uh, Serbian nationalist ended up assassinating a Serbian king as well. And notice how the, the name of the country was the kingdom of uh, Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, where are the rest of the people groups, whereas Montenegrins, where are the Bosniaks or Muslims, as as they were not the same, where, where are the Northern Macedonians? Albanians were also part, Hungarians were also part, especially in Vojvodina up here, but also other places in uh, Yugoslavia. So the, a lot of other ethnic groups were left out. Those were why they were renamed to just Yugoslavia. Now, a few things here. Uh, Croatians by this time would have much preferred a federative state. You know, people like the idea of Yugoslavia because at least, you know, we're ruling over each other and, you know, not being ruled by uh, a powerful empire somewhere else. They like that, I guess, but... They disagreed on how it's going to be ruled. The Croats, I guess, and the Bosniaks and Slovenes as well, much would have preferred a decentralized federative states, while the Serbs would have preferred a much more centralized state around uh, Belgrade. This led to a lot of tension. And uh, this, what he was, he was skipping to the Nazi Germany and fascist Italy parts and the rise of the Ustasha. This is when... It was basically the nail in the coffin for Yugoslavia. That's when I think Yugoslavia already started to die and tensions between the ethnic groups went from being good-ish to very bad-ish. Okay. And uh, several deep wounds would have been um, inflicted. And also the ethnic structure of Yugoslavia would shift around due to constant warfare going on like yeah you see like there was a lot of croatians here in northern bosnia and uh, central bosnia southern bosnia but after a few wars happened and the bosnians war a lot of them ended up leaving the area even even during the time of yugoslavia so ethnicities shifted around as well uh due to you know istra and serbs from croatia of course so Many would think, was it possible to even unite in the first place? Here's what I think would have had to go on. The, the king of the 
kingdom of Yugoslavia, should have taken a Croatian queen. That's one idea. So in a sense, the, it's, you know, uniting the ethnicities, like they recognize each other as, you know, being a part of a greater Yugoslavia. They should have, get, you know, done something like that to, to unite the ethnicities. And one thing that that should have, the, the, how the Germans ended up uniting was that they're, they had a deep-seated hatred for France. Uh, so they hated being ruled over by the French and you know, the, the Catholics and the Protestants, which have tried to kill each other historically, ended up uniting into a powerful German state now. Did Yugoslavia, did, did the ethnicities in Yugoslavia see, the, see a common enemy? Like some would say, oh, the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, of course. Well, sure, maybe Serbia and Croatia don't view them favorably, but the Muslims in the area viewed them very favorably, and they thought they, they had even more rights within the Ottoman Empire than out of the Ottoman Empire. So you would say probably, I don't know, with the West, like Croatia maybe wanted with more, more ties with France and say Italy, for example. Well, maybe the Catholics like that idea, but definitely the Orthodox and the Muslims wouldn't really like that idea. But let's say Serbia would, would have preferred to, you know, go with Russia as well, while, while all the other ethnicities distrusted and maybe even disliked Russia. So... They didn't have common enemies and they didn't have common friends either. What they really needed was a common enemy. And let's say, I don't know, Italy tried to move in and slaughter absolutely everybody. Did They didn't discriminate. You know, they didn't try to divide and conquer. They just try to kill literally everyone, you know. And then all the ethnicities would have united and to fight off a common uh, enemy. That never happened. Yeah, so this area was very prone to foreign influence. As even like to this day as well so that's one problem they don't have common enemies uh and they don't have common friends either nothing really uniting them in that regard the the thing that really unites them is language because well not for the Sl slovenians and the albanians and the uh northern macedonians i guess but for the croats the bosniaks and serbs basically they speak the same language that's what really unites them. The culture, you can say, is very same-ish. Not the exact same, but same-ish. I don't know, that, and that's where the similarities really started to end. But ...pushing for more autonomy, and perhaps even independence. In 1941, the kingdom was invaded, divided, and conquered. The Croatians were offered an independent state by the Germans. Under a checkered flag, the separatist Croatians were encouraged to begin a genocide against the Serbs, inspired by old religious rivalries. Throughout the war, royalists and partisans fought against the occupation. Communist revolutionary Josip Broz Tito. Oh, those royalists of the uh, of Serbia were known as the Chetniks. So they were kind of like troopers in a, in a way. How you would uh, how you would translate it? Now they honestly started doing something similar to the. Nazi puppet state of Croatia, the Ustashe. Uh, they just started killing every other ethnicity. Not all of them, of course, but a lot of them ended up just killing a ton of Muslims, ton of Al, ton of Croatians as well. They were doing something similar. They started doing ethnic cleansing as well. Probably not as successful as, let's say, the Ustashe regime, which ended up killing around uh, 200,000. Now, Croatians uh, claim that around 70,000 Serbs were killed in the Jasinovac camp, which was basically like the Balkan Auschwitz. Uh, it can be found just uh, across the border of Bosnia into Croatia, a small town known as Jasinovac, which was basically a detention camp for mostly the Serbs, but also of Jews and of Romas, gays as well, and even some dissident Croats and Bosniaks, uh, which they viewed as the pure population of the independent state of Croatia, uh, the Muslims and the Croatians. Even they were slaughtered occasionally in that camp. So uh, the Croats say around 70,000, the Serbs say even up to 600,000. I, I think one is too low, the other one's too high. 200,000, maybe around 150,000-ish is the more realistic range. Because 70,000, that seems a little too little. Uh, and 600,000 is absurd. If there were 600,000 deaths, I don't think there would have be would be any Serbs in, in in Croatia and Bosnia at all. If there were that many deaths, no, 
it just didn't happen. And it's not like they went to every single place. Like, the Ustasha regime was surprisingly not active at all in eastern Bosnia. The Chetnik regime was, if anything, more active in eastern Bosnia. Uh, they were active in western Bosnia, like around the town of Bihać, where a lot of Serbs were killed. Uh, but not in every single place. Remember, this place is very mountainous, and rule over this area is very nominal. And in some places, you would have even the Hunjar division, which was kind of like uh, Muslim Nazis or Muslim Aryans that were aiding the Ustasha, mostly in northeastern uh, Bosnia and some parts of uh, Sriam as well, which is like uh, uh, an area in between the Sava and Danube rivers uh, as well. He distinguished himself when he led the partisans to victory. Tito's partisans were devoted to him, and so the former monarch of Yugoslavia was to remain in exile as Tito, with some support from the Soviets, established the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia in 1945. The country was organized as a federation of six socialist republics, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Macedonia, Montenegro, Slovenia, and Serbia. In addition, Serbia held the two autonomous states of Kosovo and Vojvodina, and hosted the country's capital of Belgrade. Under Tito, the country was a now, uh, if we go back here for a second, you notice how uh, Yugoslavia, like, where, where did this territory come from? We have Istria and we have, you know, Slovenia gaining uh, access to the sea. Well, this was actually part of uh, Trieste. Uh, the Italian Italians basically ruled over uh, this area. And after Yugoslavia won, they were handed territory because they were part on, they were part of the Allies, technically, and they were on the winning side and they ended up... Uh, gaining some territory as well so they ended up gaining uh istria and this part was given to slovenia so they would have uh, access to the sea which they didn't have before also there was also some uh reshuffling of the borders as well like bosnia actually had not one access to the sea but two accesses to the sea i guess this place known as Sutarina, which is now a part of um, Montenegro, it was similar, a similar small panhandle as Gnome you would see here. It had a panhandle going through here that split Croatia from Montenegro. But I guess the, the ruling parties at the time thought it would make more sense for Montenegro to, have, to administer that territory instead of Bosnia. Things changed, I guess. And we have what we have Belgrade. here. Under Tito, the country was a dictatorship. A one-party state with the president for Enlightened life. It operated on propaganda and doing whatever was necessary to maintain brotherhood and unity. Due to disagreements with Stalin and risking a near war with the Soviets, Yugoslavia became a strange blend of East and West in a time where that wasn't a good idea. It was a great idea though as foreign aid came in from both sides and the country began to liberalize and form a unique brand of socialism known as Titoism. Tito would evoke his former life as a poor farmer and his reputation as a war hero to remain relatable and beloved with the people he reigned over. He was quick to crack down on nationalistic sentiment and so held the country together firmly, but all knew it couldn't last. Tito died on May 4th, 1980, aged 87. That's not to say that nationalism didn't exist at the time, but if you were found to be a national nationalist in the time, they could even send you to the Goliotok, which basically translates to the Barren Island, which was a, a barren island off the coast of Croatia, or off the coast of Dalmatia, I guess. Uh, and it was basically the Alcatraz of Yugoslavia, and it was a pretty brutal, pretty nasty place where all the nationalists, not just nationalists, but anybody that was considered an enemy of the state was sent to, and a lot of them ended up dying there. The old man had left the people, and so what was after Tito? Well, Tito. The presidency was decentralized and became collective, made up of representatives and a mostly symbolic president of the presidency. They tried to pretend for almost a decade that Tito was living on. Only when the Cold War ended, the foreign aid ceased and the economy came tumbling down did the people realize Tito was gone. The problems caused people to search for someone to blame. In Kosovo, the blame was put on the Albanians living in the area. Kosovo Serbs claimed Kosovo Albanians were pushing them out of the country and began a counter movement against this. President of Serbia, Ivan Stambolic, decided he would send his right-hand man, Slobodan Milosevic, to quell the unrest in 87. When he arrived, yeah. however, he spoke only what the Kosovo Serbs wanted to hear. He created himself a devoted following. In what would be called the anti-bureaucratic revolution, he used his supporters to force governments in Vojvodina, Montenegro, and Kosovo to be replaced with his allies. Eventually, Stambolic was forced to resign in favor of Milosevic in 89. With he and his allies in control of many areas in Yugoslavia, his representative in the presidency, Borisav Jovic, led a voting bloc. The power was used to erode Body the autonomy slab? of Kosovo and Vojvodina. The Albanian miners of Kosovo collaborated in a strike against this in 89. 
Milosevic had federal police troops moved in. With this, he could crack down on the Albanians. This kind of action did not sit well with the republics of Croatia and Slovenia. Slovenia's media ran with stories of Milosevic the fascist. Milosevic deemed that this was only spreading unfounded fear of Serbia and attempted to see authorities restrict Slovenia's press, only driving further sentiment that Slovenia must escape Serbia's influence. Milosevic attempted to use his Kosovar Serbs to depose Slovenia's dissident president, Milan Kuchan. Croatia backed up Slovenia, refusing passage to the protesters. The political stalemate led to the 14th Congress being convened in January 1990. The Congress was attended by delegates from all republics and provinces. The debate was reform, whether to offer more autonomy to the republics of Yugoslavia or to build a stronger state of brotherhood and unity. Every proposal from Kuchan was shot down by the Serbian voting bloc. The climate became tense and very, very frustrating. The Slovenian delegation walked, leaving the Congress. When Milosevic attempted to continue without them, Croatia, Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina walked too. There was no unity to be found. When each republic held their first ever free election, nationalist parties began to defeat the former communist ones in Macedonia, Slovenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia. In Croatia, the controversial Franjo Tudjman had come to power under the promise to protect them from Milosevic. Um, despite nowadays Franjo Tudjman to be considered, you know, <laughs> a proponent of Ustashaism, you know, being an Ustasha, uh, he, during World War II, he was actually part of the partisan movement. Yeah, Franjo Tudjman fought for brotherhood and unity, and at the end he became a crazy nationalist, which he... Yeah, kind of was towards the end of his life. He died in 1999. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Alija Zedbegovic, the multicultural leader of uh, Bosnia and the Bosniaks. So Alija Zedbegovic actually wrote the Islamic Declaration. And uh, through this declaration, somehow Serbs were, uh, you know, uh, using it to justify their actions against Bosnia and, you know, the ultra-nationalists of Bosnia. Now, me being a Bosniak as well, I heavily disagree with the Islamic Declaration. I prefer a much more a secularized state than any sort of Islamic state. So, despite that, you know, Alia Zbigwish did write that, you know, I uh, completely disagree with them. I'm more a part of the secular Bosniaks as opposed to the Islamic uh, Bosniaks. And I say for the most part, yeah, most Bosniaks are just like that. They're very secularized, you know. Muslims, in a sense. We don't take religion that seriously um, anymore, I guess. So that's just one thing. Franjo Tujman ended up becoming a nationalist, though he was multicultural at one point, but Alize Begovic was once nationalist and became multicultural. Okay, <laughs> only in the Balkans. His nationalistic sentiment and his readiness to embrace the old checkered flag brought back painful memories of the genocides that had scarred many Serbian families. The checkered flag of Croatia goes back way before the Ustasha, okay? Uh, there is a story, I don't know how true it is, that first of all, Croatia is not the only country in the world that has a checkered flag. If you check flag of Moravia, it has also a checkered eagle flag. But also some other places use the checkered flag, similar to this. Now, the one story it is it represents the red and white Croatia, which was like way back in the day, that united to form uh, the kingdom of Croatia, but another interesting story was uh, once the king of uh, Croatia, I don't know if this is true or not, once the king of Croatia was kidnapped by the king of Hungary, and the king of, king of Hungary told him, hey, you know what, I'll, I'll let you go if you beat me in chess. Uh, the king of then Croatia obliged okay and the king of croatia ended up winning uh the chess game at the end and he was let go and they decided to make that their checkered flag i don't know which one's true but uh, we may never know at the end exactly why that is the the symbol of croatia and the croatian people the croatian serbs refused to let this happen again and rose up in kanin in august securing small arms and barricading roads they demanded that if Croatia chose to secede, that the Serbian majority areas, or as they would later proclaim themselves, the Republic of Serbian Karina, would not. Borisav Jovic, now head of the Yugoslav presidency, was ready to offer support to the Croatian Serbs' concerns. Tudjman, however, would not accept this and had helicopters dispatched to Kanin ready to put down the rebellion. 
Jovic showed his hand when two Yugoslav fighter jets intercepted the helicopters and forced them to return to base. Serbia's influence had now consumed the Yugoslav People's Army, and so Tuđman would have to find his own way to fight. Hungarian arms began to be smuggled into Croatia, and at the same time Slovenes held a referendum asking the people if they desired independence. The people answered yes. The results of the referendum and later in 91, the exposure of Croatian's arms smuggling led to the army command requesting the presidency enact a state of emergency. Croatian representative Stjep Mjesic strongly debated the army head in Jovic. He accused the two of attempting to create a greater Serbia, whereas the army head insisted they foreign powers did. were conspiring to destroy Yugoslavia. Regardless of either were true or not, it would mean war. The vote was placed in the Bosnian representative's hands and after some serious arming and erring, it was rejected. Things calmed very very slightly, but when Jovic's term came to an end in May and it was time that Mjesic took head, he was blocked and the title offered to another Milosevic loyalist. The Croatians responded with an independence referendum that won in a landslide, most likely because the Croatian Serbs didn't show up to vote. On June 25th, 1991, both anyway. the republics of Slovenia and Croatia declared their independence, beginning the very violent dominant collapse of Yugoslavia. The fighting in Croatia had been on for some time, but now with official declarations, the YPA saw fit to involve themselves. They moved an army to Slovenia's border, which immediately prompted reactions from the Slovenes. The meant to be, but they totally didn't, decommissioned territorial defences prepared resistance on border checkpoints and important roads, repelling the relatively small initial Yugoslav force. A short war with little casualties, a rarity in future, the conflict would be creatively named the Ten Day War. The European- uh, This was basically because the Slovenes were- basically ethnically pure. It's just Slovenes in Slovenia, very little Serbs and other people groups. So the JNA or the Yugoslav National Army just was like, eh, Slovenia is left. And that's that. A similar thing would go with uh, Macedonia as well, because there's very little Serbs in uh, Northern Macedonia. Well, it was just referred to as Macedonia at the time nowadays, Northern Macedonia. Uh, very little Serbs there, they didn't feel a need, and they just left that area. But anywhere else where there were Serbs, Different story. community placed pressure on the belligerents to open negotiations leading to the Brioni Agreement on July 7th, 91. Croatia, Slovenia and Yugoslavia agreed to withdraw the YPA from Slovenia and allow Slovenia to take control of their borders given that Croatia and Slovenia suspend their declarations for three months. This three months barely phased the fighters battling in Croatia, but Slovenia used this time to make themselves into an actual country while the YPA prepared an invasion into that country that couldn't fail. The plan was scrapped though on the reason that it's Slovenia who gives a shit. And so Slovenia had slipped away, but at the cost of leaving Croatia in the YPA's sights. Tuđman's fight stemmed from his insistence that he'd defend every inch of Croatia. In spite of it though, the rebels had made great successes, I mean, securing <laughs> many Serb-majority towns and then some. Yugoslavia offered support as well, giving the rebels equipment and artillery. Later the YPA itself arrived at the border as peacekeepers, peacekeepers that allowed the rebels to push forward and siege Vukovar in August. Things looked fairly bleak in Yugoslavia. So bleak that Macedonia passed a referendum and left. Just like that. It really makes everything seem a bit dramatic. The bleakness also caught the attention of The Hague, who arranged a peace conference with all six presidents. Tuđman insisted Croatia had the right to secede. Milosevic countered that then Krajina should too. Lord Carrington, head of the conference, asked if Milosevic would be prepared to accept Croatian independence if it was subject to the human rights of Serbs living outside of Serbia. Milosevic answered yes. When the written deal arrived though, it stated that all six republics would take this route. Milosevic could not agree. He had no intentions of breaking up Yugoslavia. By November, Vukovar fell, and those who had resisted were subject to massacre. By the dawn of 1992, a UN ceasefire would put a pause to the pain. However, another conflict had been brewing alongside the Battle of Vukovar. Uh oh. Yep, that's enough of that. I okay, so that was part one, and I'll be recording part two just right after this, and it should be up in a few days after you're seeing this. So I'll end it off here. Thank you all for watching, and as always, take care.